Welcome in to the best in paranormal programming. This is Darkness Radio. I'm your host, Tim Dennis. I'm excited for today's program, folks. Uh, we have back a guest that you all have been asking for uh, ever since I had him on the first time. Uh, we're talking demonologist and author Nathaniel Gillis. A lot of you talked to me by email, by messenger, and said, man, this guy blew my mind. He blew my mind with the stuff that he had on the first time. And I tell you, there's there's a lot there. There's a lot there. We're going we're gonna to recap a little bit about what he had to say the first time he was on. And uh, we're going to also get to talk about some of the new stuff that he's come across and some of the new theories and it, let's just call it facts, the, the stuff that he's come across uh, since he left us last. Uh, just to catch up with you, Nathaniel Gillis, after living in a haunted house, uh, spent 20 years researching what he would come to define as preternatural. I'm going to have a hard time with this word, Nathaniel. Is this epiphenomenal? Epiphenomenal. There we go. Epiphenomenal philosophy. It is his belief that demonology is not the study of new life, rather the study of old Old life in a new way. He's often quoted for his concept of the demonic. The reason they are playing by different rules is because they are playing a different game. Nathaniel has sought to redefine the nature of haunting phenomena, ghosts, aliens, demons, and other experiences of high strangeness. Let's welcome back to Darkness Radio, Nathaniel Gillis. Welcome back, my friend. Thank you for having me on. And it's uh, like I told you pre-show had a blast with you in the last time and uh, i love your viewers and uh, it's glad to be back with you my friend hey we love you I, you know i had a lot of people a lot of people whose let's just say worldview on the paranormal was shook after you were on last time and you know i i brought your theories to a lot of our guests after you were on last time and a lot of them went yeah wow um yeah i see that <laughs> I really do see that. And I think, uh, although I, I have been told, you know, that's not the first time I've heard that theory, but it really does fit. So I've heard, I've heard a couple different schools of thought. Um, but when I tell people, you know, this isn't just a theory that you picked out of thin air. This is things that happen to you. Then they go, oh, yeah, okay. Well, now this changes the game a little bit. Um, right. Yeah. Right. And, and remind people uh, and remind our audience what it was exactly that had happened to you. Well, my first confrontation with the phenomenon was when I was eight years old. My parents had moved into a haunted house. And uh, the very first night I was in that house, I could smell this sulfuric, I guess, stench in the room. And uh, from that moment on, as soon as we moved in, I saw uh, apparitions. I saw shadow people. Um, there was a, a black ball of just gray matter, if you will, like a cloud that would hover in the corner of the room at certain times. And uh, it was some level and haunting. And I didn't understand why it chose me, and, you know, why it was only me that experienced it. It didn't manifest to anyone else in the house. And it kind of just, um, it, was, it was instrumental in the development of my passion. Why am I in this field? It's because of what I went through at that young age. And uh, if anything, it, it, it strengthened my desire to want to understand, you know, what is what's really going on in these hauntings? What are we encountering? Is it demonic or is it alien? Mm -hmm. Right. And so that's what kind of led me into where I am at today. Interesting. At one point uh, when we were talking last time, you had connected the demonic and the alien one and the same, and you had done it through an experience. You said you had watched this creature switch from one form to another. Can you tell our audience about that, that particular story one more time? Yeah, so even at the open house, prior to my parents purchasing it, I was looking at what, what would become my future room, taking a look around, where, and I'm a kid, so I'm thinking, okay, where am I gonna put my gaming system? Where's my bed gonna be? Mm -hmm. And uh, for some reason, I was uh, led to get on all fours and look underneath the bed that was in that room. And when I did, I was met with a full face of, of an apparition, a full bodied apparition I'm staring at her. She's may have been six or seven years old. She was pale in complexion, had long black hair. And I remember her shivering, shivering like her, her whole body all the way back to the wall. And so I'm thinking this is, a, this must be some neighborhood child that snuck in, you know, while the realtor's getting ready for the, the open house. 
Uh, but sure enough, once we moved into that house, that entity mutated and evolved. It was not, in fact, a little girl at all. It was a malevolent being that was trying to manipulate my innocence. Mm. And so from that moment on, number one uh, lesson that I, that I learned in that, in that moment was that the phenomenon is highly deceptive. Mm -hmm extremely deceptive and uh, to the point where it can manipulate our senses and uh, deceive our innocence. So that's really where we are. If I could encapsulate the whole field, that's what we're yeah. trying to understand right now. Yeah. You know, ever since you've been on the program the first time, it's changed the way that I've seen certain things. Um, you know, I, I sit and I watch uh, programs like the secret, the C secrets, or rather the secret of skinwalker ranch uh, on history mm -hmm. channel. I, I know I'm butchering the name of the program. Um, and I watch guys like Travis Taylor and his, his crew go out mm -hmm. and what they're looking for on skinwalker ranch. And I think of the combined theory of alien and demon being one and the same. Mm -hmm. And you see the combination of ghostly haunting and, right. And these things in the sky, these lights in the sky. And the fact that they're trying to separate phenomena as one thing happening here in this house and it being a ghostly phenomena and then seeing strange lights in the sky and then, you know, what they deem radiation poisoning happening over here. Is it too much from a scientific point of view, Nathaniel, to say, stop separating that they should be considering this all one thing 100 percent. i am a proponent of what's called the unified field theory and i think that uh, especially a lot of the researchers researchers i've spoken to across the pond in the uk they echo that same sentiment and the problem with us as researchers and experiencers alike is that uh, we've compartmentalized the phenomenon and what i've been able to do in my career is I, i've been able to have incubi victims sit down on a table and talk to UFO abductees and you'll be shocked as to what you'll learn from them. Their experiences are the same, mm. right? The protocols of what I call the protocols of belief, belief and operation were the same. Uh, the symbology carved into their flesh are the same. Uh, it, so that's what I realized that again, if we can stop compartmentalizing the phenomenon, then we can actually give these experiencers a safe place to articulate what they've encountered without saying, okay, well, that's just you. We're a whole different field of thought. We're not, uh, especially if you get into biblical antiquity, our oldest experiencers, uh, they kind of put agency to what could possibly be programs where that's an actual demon. And so meanwhile, what you're witnessing in ufology as well, you know, that has to be alien. It's not demonic. And to the Christian, you know, especially with evangelical Christianity, if it's not alien, it has to be demonic. If it's not demonic, it's nothing else. And so what I've been trying to articulate in the field as of late is, hey, listen, we all need to sit down at the same table. Because if we're not at the same table, we're all going to be on the menu. Yeah. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I I have a direction I want to go with what you said at the end there. But, but let's backtrack a little bit because you said something that's intriguing me. I want to dive deeper on it. That is... The similarities between incubi and and alien, for lack of a better term, abduction or or probing or uh, victims of that sort, um, and the similarities between the two, would it be different to say when I've talked to experiencers that have dealt with alien aliens in general, what they believe are aliens? They've talked about implants, whereas people who have had problems with incubi, I haven't heard anything having to do with implants. Am I wrong here, or is there is that the separation line? Well, if we're talking about a, a physical metallic implant, no. But if we're looking at the implantation of seed, 100%. Okay. Right. Now, the implant itself, in terms of uh, technology being connected to a piece of metal, is it's, it's found in biblical antiquity as well. It's not modern. It's modern to us because much of our research is new to us. Mm -hmm. uh, but your first implants were, were what's called a rite of necromancy, okay. which we're going to get into possibly with another connection between both phenomena. But what, what people were doing in antiquity 
is they were carving the name of an unclean spirit into a piece of metal and planting it into a person. And the consciousness of that entity would stretch itself into that person. And now that person becomes semi-possessed and there's consciousness looking through their own eyes. Now we've seen that in the modern lens as the implantation phenomenon, but that's been here for thousands of years and by their own testimony of these beings, they've told us why they're doing it. And it's for the same purposes that we found in biblical antiquity. They want to see through our eyes. They want to control us. And so that's why when you get into the study of implants, many of them seem to be alive themselves. Ah, right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So that's a whole other thing. But in terms of symbology, when you're dealing with incubi cases, it's very, very, it's not even signal. It's the same. Like, for instance, Father Sinistra of Amino, he was working with uh, a family where these beings were basically, in, for a lack of a better word, they were using the wife as a breeder, a host, if you will, Okay. where they were monitoring her fertility and they were manifesting to her in a, in a new, new number of guises and uh, masks. And then they would inseminate her and, and she would have kids, babies, hybrids, all of this stuff. And so Sinistra of Amino was investigating her physical markings on her body when they peeled back one of their, her eyelids and they found unusual symbols that this being had carved underneath her eyelids. Now, this is a phenomenon, again, that has stretched its draconian shadow from antiquity to modernity. But what we've done in, in our attempt to understand the phenomenon is we've compartmentalized it. That's old. This is new. That's demonic. This is alien. And in doing so, we've neglected to take in the full width, height, and breadth of what we're experiencing as a species. Okay, wow. Um, peeling back the eyelid and finding symbols. Yes. He had marked her. Whoa. Uh Okay, so I have to I have to ask questions about a child that's born out of this mm -hmm. type of activity. Mm -hmm. Now, in the eyes of the church, can that child ever be clean? I mean, if if something is born of of an incubi type activity, is that mm -hmm. child ever a child of God? Can you ever go backwards and make that child pure? It's a good question. The, uh, the old demonological argument that many of us are still having is, does that entity have a soul? Or was it designed to be soulless? So the hypothesis that I've been working on is what, what we're dealing with are bodiless souls and then soulless bodies. And so this, this entire self-replication program that we're witnessing in both aspects of the field, it's been occurring for millennia. I've had my own cases of women who they, they begin to be monitored from puberty. And then one woman called me on the side of a highway crying, my friend, crying. Mm -hmm. Can I get a hold of you? I said, okay, what's going on? And sometimes I can't answer as much as like many messages I want to, but finally we got on the phone. She's crying. I said, what? She was like, last, last month she said, I had a hysterectomy. And she said the same beings that had been monitoring my fertility from a young girl showed up in my room at nighttime were running tests. And when they realized that I could no longer host a hybrid, they left me alone entirely. So the idea here is that what we are dealing with, is it a hybrid, a hybrid uh, species? But what is it? Is it is a soulless body that in my, in my research led me to believe that what these beings are doing is they're implanting their own consciousness within these hybrids and wearing them. It's a lot like possession wearing them as what's called social skins where now they have a body to interact with us in. and uh, this gets into the idea of them being biological avatars of consciousness wow. I, I can keep rambling it's explosive no, stuff i know you're not know. rambling <laughs> at all i mean don't i mean to you you may feel like you're rambling but this is explosive stuff here nathaniel i mean right okay so they've created this avatar essentially this soulless body that they now can inhabit Correct. And then they can produce a physical seed to keep going. So, I mean, okay, here's the ivory test. What's pure? Uh, what if, is pure? 
So you're not 100% oh. evil, okay? You're not 100% demonic seed, but right. essentially you've produced an evil seed or an evil body that's at least 50% evil or 50% demon if you want to if you want to do the ancestry test on this deal. Right. Um, right. but now you're inhabited by an evil being uh, right. in in this carcass if you want to put it that way. And you are at least 50% demon in that body, and you're carrying on to reproduce, so to speak. But then you're carrying on and carrying down and watering down, so to speak, down the lineage, as I understand it, correct? Or is it because there is that demon within that body that spiritually lifts up the percentage? Correct. What we're looking at are biological avatars with with an entity that has its own consciousness within that body. Um, getting back to, okay, what's really occurring here? We, we, we don't even have the vocabulary to, to articulate what is occurring here. We don't, we simply don't know yet, but I can tell you this much. Sinistria of Amina was having more case studies where the woman said, look, I don't even know what I copulated with, right? Because it did not fall, fall underneath the umbrella of purely demonic or purely alien. And so the early church was like, okay, if, if we don't even have an understanding of what is being copulated with, right? Mm -hmm. We know how it manifests to us, but is that really the entity itself? And so that, you know, if it doesn't fall into a sin, you understand what I'm saying? Right. Well, how did I sin? I, it wasn't, you know, and that, that's the whole idea of, you know, the sons of God, one of the daughters of men. How is that a sin? There is no sin against that. It makes it's make right because it's so far beyond our comprehension. It wasn't even in, it wasn't even listed in the bylaws. Um, so, so the whole idea here, though, is that there is a species that has been integrating with us forever, and uh, they're 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 playing by their own rules, my friend. And that's what has disturbed me the most. We we're being deceived. I mean, I've had cases in India where uh, one woman had a, an entity, one entity, mm -hmm. manifest to her in the images of every man she's been with. Really? Yes. Quite literally. No, no, I'm just going to, I don't want to get you demonetized or anything. I'm so I won't say anything too bad, but uh -huh. uh, even to the point where the first images that manifested to her in was, was the men that did not wear protection. Now, why, why would that be? Because there's what I call to be a protocol of belief occurring. Do you believe I am that man? Okay. Right. Right. Well, you didn't let him, you didn't have to have him wear protection. So what they're doing, though, is there is this psychological war occurring because now what they're doing is they're increasing the probability of insemination. Ah, uh, OK. Which is really dark stuff. It is dark. That, I mean, that's that's really playing with the mind and really. I mean, it, it's it not only playing with the mind, but playing with the heart. And that's that's if you right. win the heart, you win the mind. Uh, essentially. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I'll tell you what, I did a show not too long ago, and um, the host of it, we were, uh, it was after the show, we're in the back of the green room, we're talking. He's like, you know, he goes, I'm going to tell you about a story that I had, and something I experienced. I said, all right. And uh, he goes, well, he goes, about a few years ago, before I met my wife, he said I had broken up with a girlfriend. And, uh, you know, we, we hadn't talked in months, hadn't seen her, hadn't heard about her. We haven't spoken at all. He said, I had actually rented out a new apartment across town, uh, at my, my new job. Everything is just, you know, completely separate from her. He said, one night, he said, I'm drinking a beer or something, and I get a knock on my door. And I open it, and it's that ex-girlfriend. Hmm. And, um, yeah, and so she seduced him. And the next morning, he wakes up. There's no memory of her there. She's not there at all, my friend. Hmm. She's gone. So later that day... He goes to work and he's looking, you know, he's wondering, okay, what that, that the whole night felt really weird. Yeah. There was something off about her. So when they got off of work, he picked up a cell phone, dialed her number. Is this so and so? Yes, it is. Uh, well, you, you left this morning without saying goodbye. Like, wh what's going on? He said, matter of fact, how did you even find me? And this ex girlfriend said, I have no idea what you're talking about. That was not me. And furthermore, I don't want you to call me anymore. Whoa. On up the phone. What are we dealing with? Well, can I? Can I I'm going to keep going on for a little bit. Yeah, please. Because uh, I want to make a really, some very interesting points, at, at least in my perspective. Yep. Um, we have case studies like that throughout history that are quite troubling. 
um, in the 16th century, the deep book phenomenon, we have tons of cases that involve demonic possession that started out as possession, but ended up with demonic pregnancy. And this is how it began. Okay. It's going to, it's the same motif through and through. You'll see it. Uh, but anyways, these women uh, were going to bed at nighttime and in the middle of the, the, their, their night, uh, they would have a nightmare mm-hmm. and an entity would manifest to them in a dream state. It would accost them. The next morning, they get up, they take a shower, they start looking at their wrists and their legs, and they realize that there are bruises that directly correlated with their experience in the middle of that nightmare. So these were very, they were very well documented Mm -hmm. symbols and even ligature marks on their skin that again, it mirrored what they experienced in that nightmare. And this occurred so often that in one Baghdad text written for demonic possession, if the woman was possessed, have you been accosted by an entity in the middle of the night? It sounds like you have abduction phenomenon. Did it induce you into a dream-like state? Hold on. Did it stare into your eyes in order to do so? And over and over and over again, yes, it happened. Now, the phenomenon evolved according to their own pathologies. Number one, when the woman was accosted, not only were they uh, were they carving amulets and, and symbols into their flesh, not only were there bite marks and uh, scratches, even more so, the, so, many of these women became possessed by the consciousness of the entity that assaulted them. Now, you see it, it's changing its shape, right? It gives you chills. It's scary. But it's changing its shape, and our eyes are adjusting to the darkness. We're starting to see what it's been after all along. Now, the sexual pathology that we're talking about now, it keeps evolving. It changes. So in in, in one year, you had maybe 12 or 15 different cases of of possession. Mm -hmm. The woman is now going to the priest or the exorcist, and there's a disembodied voice coming out of her. And it's the voice of the entity that had assaulted her in that nightmare. Now, during these case studies, one exorcist comes across a woman who had the same symptomology, the same story. Okay. The same abduction, if you will. Okay. In in the end of it, the entity had crawled up in her womb in the shape of a fetus. Whoa. To the point that they were performing the Lavouche method, where they would put their the other thumbs on the wrists of these women. They would feel two pulses in one body. Hello, pregnancy, two heartbeats in one body. Which led, which led them to ask them the most profound question I've heard yet in the field. Was she possessed by this entity or was she impregnated by this entity? See, you have abduction. Yeah. So she was not just possessed with the consciousness of this entity, but she was pregnant with the fetus that had it inseminated her with. And so in one fleeting moment, what you have is the missing fetus syndrome. But you also have the consciousness inside of it. Wow. Now, when the exorcism takes place, here's here's what this is when your eyes are gonna really open. You're gonna be like, oh my God, it makes perfect sense. When the exorcism took place, when they removed this is gonna make you this, this freaks me out. When they removed the consciousness of that entity, the phenomenon took the fetus from the womb. Really? Yes. That is the missing fetus syndrome. Wow. The consciousness, right. The consciousness of that entity was inside the fetus that they had inseminated her with. And when the consciousness left that body, the phenomenon said, okay, then we're taking the fetus as well. So what we're seeing right now is it's not just the hybridization of DNA, but it's the emerging their consciousness with the babies they're hatching inside of people of women. And it's an so all that's or, a big piece of the puzzle. Yeah. It's an all or nothing proposition. All or nothing. So it, you're getting you're getting the demon or nothing. I want to backtrack a little bit. You were mentioning the 
the start of this with the carving of the amulets and symbols on the actual woman, to me, that that assumes ownership. So, uh, it, you know, I mean, it and, and you'd mentioned before them not knowing where they had sinned or how they had sinned. But let me go back to the the assumption of of letting them in. OK, in a right. dream state, you, you're not aware in a dream state. We all assume dream states are passive states, right? right. That, that when we dream, we're not active, that that our brain is taking over and sorting itself out from the activities of the day. We're trying to we're trying to or our brain is at least trying to figure out what it was we went through during the day. And in scientific terms, Nathaniel, we're, we're yeah. trying to get rid of the garbage and we're trying to realign for the next day. Right. Yeah. Uh -huh. So if we're having what we think is just a passive dream and we run into this right. demon slash alien, whatever it may be, and it sneaks in the back door through our dreams and we see something that may be an X and we go, oh, it's an X. It's just a mm -hmm. fling. And we're going with it because it feels good. Right. We've given it permission, even though we don't mean to give it permission. Exactly. Exactly. And this whole this whole cat and mouse game of do you believe I am who I appear to you as? It's what I call protocols of belief. And once you bite into that apple, once you feed into that thing, OK, well, yeah, you are. Well, now that entity wants to play a role, right? But how do you stop it? I mean, you, you have, <laughs> but you haven't given permission. I mean, you, right. you've given permission for the X in the dream. You haven't given Ooh. permission to a demon to take control of you. And that's a fine right. line. Right. It cannot be, cons okay, now what, what I do consider to be grooming is occurring. Absolutely. Grooming. Now, in uh, old uh, devil literature, or what they consider to be the devil, right? Mm -hmm. um, these beings would often feed these victims something to ingest. <laughs> and in the ingestation of that, ingesting rather of that, uh, something would take control over their body and, would, and it would help them kind of guide them into a scenario where um, through by virtue of intoxication or something, mm -hmm. uh, they would drug them to where they have to perform different acts and the next day they wake up thinking, okay, that's just a dream. It's not. You know, we, we were hoodwinked. We were deceived. Now, now in David Jacobs' work, he, he mentions another behavioral pattern that's obvious here is that's the, that is the, the, they stare into the eyes of their victims. Okay. Now, for the viewers out there, people are going to listen. I'm, 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 you probably won't be able to see it, but I'm, I'm reading a book now called The Demon Syndrome. And it's by Nancy Osborne. It's about uh, Anne Haywood and how her possession case started. And it started very much like what we see in the UFO abduction phenomenon. A being manifest to her in the middle of her house, stares into her eyes, and, you know, thanks to play. It's, it's, it's another scary scenario, but the idea of them staring into the eyes of their victims is not new. I may be new to some researchers because, again, you can only see, only recognize what you're looking at. Right. Um, when you're getting back to what they're doing when they stare into our eyes, uh, David Jacobs hypothesized one time that they were hacking the optic nerve. <clears throat> I would believe that's the case. Mm -hmm. But I would also believe they're hacking our brain because just right behind the location which they're staring into is, is, is the part of our brain that helps us decide whether or not what we're experiencing is real. And this gets gets back to your point, mm -hmm. right? It's deception through and through. But what these women were experiencing was, okay, literally, was that a real event or was it just a nightmare? And that's that's why it's so important to look at the behavioral patterns and the bruisings and the ligature marks. To that person, it was just a dream, right? But to that to the phenomenon, it was a it was intentional deception to where the ligature marks really occurred. So something physical happened to that individual. I'm going to take our break here. When we come back, I want to ask you about, is it the fact that there's deception there? And is that what allows us to redeem ourselves? That's the simple question we'll ask when we come back. And then I want to dive a little bit deeper into the lineage question. The lineage is what, um, what fascinates me and, and what the end game of the lineage is. 
um, and, and what is the end, end game of this whole thing. Our guest is Nathaniel Gillis. Uh, there are two books out there, A Moment Called Man and the Skin That Crawls that Nathaniel has out there, and, and we'll have a link to those uh, books here in the description of this podcast. And then uh, I also want to talk to Nathaniel a little bit about his travels as we get to the end of the program. He's got some uh, interesting things there to talk about, some interesting stories there as well. Nathaniel Gillis is our guest, and we will talk more with him as we get into the second half of the program right here on the best in paranormal podcasting. This is darkness radio. Welcome back to the Best in Paranormal Programming. This is Darkness Radio. I'm your host, Tim Dennis. Our guest is Nathaniel Gillis. He is a demonologist and author. There are two books up that uh, we have links to in the description of this program. And boy, we are hot and heavy into it today, folks. Uh, Not hot and heavy in the way that we've been talking about, but hot and heavy into it in the way that we're uh, we're deep in a discussion about... uh, Incubi and alien abduction or alien hybrids. Um, That's been the first part of our discussion here. Uh, When we left you for the break, uh, I had kind of teased here, Nathaniel, we were going to talk a little bit about, uh, well, let's, let's, let's do the first part of this here first. And that is um, I teased a little bit about the actual lineage part of this. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll I'll address I'll address it in a combined manner, both both alien and demonic, and we'll assume they're one and the same. And when it comes to the lineage question, what is the idea behind this, or the end game behind this? Because I I get I get that you want to eventually spread the seed, but is it is the idea biblical? Is the idea to water down the divinity of human beings and eventually keep them away from, and this may seem like people may think I'm sounding preachy here, but to keep them away from God's light or keep them away from the kingdom of heaven, or is it to essentially take over a planet? Is there an earthly thing to this? Uh, What is the end game behind this thing? Well, one hypothesis that I've been researching as of late is to simply stay alive to simply stay alive. If we're going to look at these these beings as if they were bodiless at one point, then we see them, uh, we see the necessity of a body that they would have. And so if you get into what's called the Apocrypha of John, it's a Coptic manuscript preserved and written by Egyptian Christian monks. Uh, They talked about these these beings manifesting to women in the same manner we're discussing tonight. You know, Mm -hmm. they said that these beings mixed with a dark spirit something deathly, something dead. They mix that seed with these children. Now, this is why it's so important for us to have a better understanding of, of vampirology. Long before, okay, long before we had the legend and lore of something coming and taking bodily fluids from us, right, from yeah. what, what they were doing, mm-hmm. uh, we, have, uh, we have Montague Summers and other researchers in that time frame where they were witnessing beings hovering over the recently deceased males in harvesting their seed and then using that to inseminate women. Mm. So whatever we're dealing with, again, it's we would call it evil. I mean, it really is once you get down to it. Um, but the whole purpose of them, according to the Apocrypha of John, was to create copies of the same body where you could have 10 different bodies, 10 different biological avatars possessed by one consciousness. And by golly, wouldn't you be experiencing that even during the Riddlesham Forest, according to Peter Robbins, right? Yeah. They were all of one mind and of one accord. When one looked up, they all did. So the idea of antiquity was that you kill one without killing the consciousness. Consciousness has to do is to recreate another hybrid baby to possess that's a whole different different show. Wow. Um, but it, it's fascinating. But the idea was that what, what these women were encountering was an apparition wanting to father its own biological avatar. By what? 
I'm getting really passionate now. So what you're seeing here, my friend, is the father, the apparition in the son, the avatar. Well, now, in Egyptology, this was a necromantic ritual. This is going to blow your mind, too. And it was designed to, to create an image of the invisible to which the entity itself has something to interact with us in. And in demon, demonology, we call that a social skin. And in exorcistic texts, especially for Malachi Martin, we would consider that hybrid to be perfectly possessed. One consciousness in it. And now, in, in my book, The Skin That Crawls, I talk about how the ghost grows in that fetus. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing them today in UFO abduction stuff. Betty Luca asked one being, where are you getting these grays from? And one of them told her, well, that's us. But we're getting them from the fetuses we're putting into women. Oh, wow. So you see the bigger picture, though, again, is to create bodies that look like the apparitions that are possessing them. So it's very interesting stuff. I know it's troubling, but it, it is interesting. Well, it's, it's troubling, but man, I mean, talk about mind-blowing stuff. It's just, it, you know, all, all right, I... I I'm gonna. I have a question that automatically pops up, but it's one that's savable for the end, I guess. One that, that I need to save for the end. Um, now, this this obviously isn't just something that's exclusive to women. I take it right. The the carving of symbols, the wanting to take over, and and possess just men it, or, or women. I mean, it, obviously, it, it it crosses over to men wanting the the seed of men, but but also wanting to take over the bodies of men. I, I, now, th there's more than one way to skin a cat here, my friend, isn't there? There's more than one way to <laughs> to get in and possess a body rather than just mm -hmm. impregnation. Um, mm -hmm. I believe you have a story of someone who was taken over in a different way, correct? 100%, and it's troubling. And I think that uh, the implications of, of this great truth, they're weighty, they're heavy. And I think that uh, it, it expands our perception of this phenomenon in a way that many people aren't ready for because they want to be so trusting of the other side. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm going to preface this story with the following. These beings have such power. They know when certain people will die. They can manifest as deceased people. Ted Rice, as an eight-year-old boy, thought that he was discussing a topic or talking to his deceased grandfather until that entity assaulted him as a child. Well, and it, he realized he backed up and looked at him and the entity changed shape and it wasn't his deceased grandfather at all. Whoa. I've had, I've had, okay. I've had elementary school teachers email me. Hey, look, you know, I'm, I'm counseling this young boy about this or this young girl, like these beings. Okay. They're not, they're not lovers of light. These things are nasty, nasty things. Anyways, moving on uh, again, these things can manifest um, in any which way they want to. And so this specific case study, I was doing a lecture about symbolism underneath eyelids and different hidden parts of the body. So an individual reached out to me via email. We set up a time to talk. Here was this story. He said his father was a renowned remote viewer and his dad would leave his body and he would meet with his so-called guides. They would give him insights, prophecies, different, different words of knowledge. At least that's what evangelicals call it. And, and so the you know, he would get back into his body. He'd pick up a cell phone, dial up a local politician, you know, for $1,200, I'll give you a reading. And it was accurate. Hmm. A lot of what these beings were telling this individual was accurate. And so he kept doing this. And, and this, this, uh, his son told me, he said, well, there, there were nights when his dad would wake him up in the middle of the night, come downstairs, turn all the lights off, and they would sit quietly in the living room until an entity showed up and begin to converse with them. Hey, this is what I've done. This is what you need to do, all this stuff. So he said uh, one night, he was playing video games or something, his dad stumbles down the stairway. He's inconsolable. He's crying, and he said his, he was shaking, and they could not get anything out of his father until his father had a massive heart attack, 
They, they wheel him into the hospital room. They're putting, they're taking his shirt off, putting on the robe. <laughs> and all of a sudden, from underneath the skin, from the subdermal area of the skin, religious amulets, religious symbols begin to push their way through the surface. Now, this is incredible because it diminishes the role demonology should play, at least our current knowledge of it. These, these symbols were interreligious, and cross-cultural. One was the Star of David. The other one was a, a cross. The, the third one is the one that disturbs me the most, was an arcing Egyptian hieroglyphic. Really? Yes. Now, it was subdermal, again, underneath to the surface. Uh -huh. When they finally got the father on medication, they got his blood pressure in check, they calmed him down and said, okay, you've got to tell us what happened. This is why we can't trust everything, right? Yeah. He said, well, he said, I was in the middle of one of my sessions. Now, this sounds like abduction. He said, in this session, I was in a metallic room, and there were, there were lines of my guys that had, they had flanked me on the right and left. And he said, I began to look at them, and he said, I always had a password with me. What's the password? And they would give you the password. That, they, that way they knew I was who I was supposed to be and that they were the guys. He said, I looked at them, and he said, I realized that they didn't know the password. Whoa. He said, and we're looking at each other for about 10 seconds. He said, that is when they changed their shape to something. He said it was absolutely terrifying. He said, that's when they slammed me back into my body and they had carved these religious amulets through my, my body to the surface. Now, this is why everybody that says they have guides, we've got to question, not, the, not just the person, but in terms of who these beings actually are. Because again, if we're looking at the amulets they carve into that person, they, we don't have rules for those, my friend because we've compartmentalized the tradition of demonology. Well, and what's absolutely chilling about what you just said is every one of those amulets that is carved into his chest is supposed to be one of protection. Absolutely. But that was put into his chest almost mockingly. Mockingly or, yeah, or in the sense of like some mathematical equation, right? Where, where they're literally, I mean, the, again, the, just the way they're employing these amulets eclipses the microcosm of any known demonology. And here's why. You know, you won't have the priest going into a home getting rid of an entity with a star of David. Mm -hmm. That's not his religious tradition. Right. Right? Right. Vice versa. You're not going to have a rabbi using the cross. And I'll tell you what, <laughs> as if you didn't already see this coming, you're certainly not going to see any of those two right? Employing Egyptian hieroglyphics. Right. But whatever we're dealing with, again, they're playing by different roles because they're playing a different game. And that's what we're after. What game are they playing? Because whatever it is through the means of deception, you know, we, we don't really know. This brings up an interesting question, uh, Nathaniel. And I, I, I'm, you know, oh man, I've got a few of them running through my head. Um, and, and that's this, you know, when, when we talk about the rules, the psychic rules that we're supposed to observe, that's, you know, surrounding yourself in a white light of protection before you do things like, like, well, it, first of all, you know, when it comes to remote viewing, they always say, well, you know, remote, remote viewing isn't psychic. Everyone can do it. It's, you know, we, we, we set up these human rules when it comes to things we can and can't do. And obviously these human rules don't pertain um, because we're, we're not, I, I think we know, we think we know every rule that pertains to the universe and we don't, uh, first of all, right. so we got to throw all that out. But, but secondly, you know, we're always told that white light of protection will, will always protect us. Are we full of shit here? I mean, pardon my language, but are we, full <laughs> of, are we full of shit here? Is that white light of protection, not all protecting? Well, I think, again, this is a, the age old question I'm often asked. I was asked that same question the other day, not the same words, but the same point. Well, right now, I mean, here's what we heard. We heard that every in every case, the cross works up until, uh, and I had a case like this, up until someone sees a light enter their room and pull the cross off their bed. Uh, you know, what? That ain't supposed to happen. Mm 
Mm-hmm. I thought, you know, I thought this is, you know, so, so again, um, this gets back to people saying, okay, especially in the, in the evangelical movement, I've heard people that are, that are researching this phenomenon. You know, if you use the, the, the name of God or, 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 you know, some religious incantation, these beings have to, to leave you alone. Well, I could tell you, and this is obviously it's difficult because I'm a pastor's kid myself. I've had cases of women where um, she called on the name of Jesus during an abduction, and they said, oh, we have Jesus too. Their Jesus showed up, looked like as some, you know, uh, Swedish Presbyterian. It wasn't even the real historical, right, first yeah. century rabbi. It was something that had fit into her blueprint of literacy. Now, this is the point that I got a hard on for everybody. In order to do that, they had to they had to measure this individual's literacy on who the accurate biblical historical Jesus was. Right. Right? right. Because if they would have done that to the late Hebrew scholar Michael Heiser, he would have laughed them to score. That is not the real Jesus. Mm-hmm. That's a projection. That's an avatar. That's deception. Right? Right. But they knew how much they could get away of or get away with with this individual. So she calls on Jesus. They said, we have Jesus. And he holds his hand out. And he said, all the seed belongs to me. All seed is mine. Whoa. Now, it sounds like an incubus, right? Yes. All yep. seed. Yep. Right? Mm-hmm. All seed is mine. And she said that, that she had three different uh, missing fetus syndrome experiences. Where they, 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 he's doing what he told her he would do. He's telling her that it's mine. It's mine. So the, even the idea of, of hybrid mothers, we're not, again, it's, it's and I, I have a lot of, of people I've dealt with like that, where we don't even have the correct vocabulary because these, be, these babies aren't even being birthed in many cases. And if they are, you'll have like a Dr. Carla T- Turner t- case where the people, these entities had to actually possess the mother enough to put the, the fetus inside of a plat- or a glass jar and hide it. And then her own memory, according to Dr. Carla Turner's book, she had no idea what happened to it. Really? So, so we, yeah, yeah, they, yeah. She had it in her, her, um, her bathroom and it looked like a gray. It was like, a, like I said, it's a hybrid, uh-huh. but the, they, they had possessed her to where she put it in a glass jar and hid it somewhere. And she didn't know where she hid it. She couldn't tell you. Right. So, so, and I, I stopped rambling, but we have to get to a point where we, we don't trust everything that they tell us. So where is the point where we can consider ourselves safe? Uh, you know, I mean, it, it, obviously you said, you know, you, you can't hold up the traditional avatar, or we'll put it this way, right. Caucasian avatar of Jesus. That's not right. You have to go True. back to Yeshua and, you, you know, you have to have that in your mind in order to combat. Does the That's typical something. white light of protection work? Uh, for psychics, uh, you know, are there, you know, you had mentioned this particular person when we were, we were going through that example, this rem- remote viewer asked for a mm-hmm. password. Was that the wrong approach? We don't know. Uh, if we're looking at amulets, religious amulets, I mean, even in hauntology, right? Mm-hmm. Um, especially within Catholicism, we're told, okay, put a cross or holy water or something in the house. Even the Carmen Snedeker case, the haunting in Connecticut, you know, that worked for a few days until she wakes up and that entity had taken the cross, threw it on the ground, and now it's in the room. So we have to quit, right? We have to quit assuming that's true, even when the data suggests it's not. Does that make sense? It does make sense. And I'll I'll give you a perfect example from my own life. Uh, I, you know, we were doing an investigation, a group investigation, uh, a group tour trip to Waverly Hills. And I was with uh, 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 I was with a group, and I watched a vial of holy water start to start to shrink inside a vial. I mean, just yeah. d- dissipate. Um, so yeah, the the rules don't the rules don't apply. They just don't. Um, they don't. It it shouldn't it shouldn't happen. But if there's something that evil there, what's holy water going to stop? You it's, know. You're correct, sir. In and this is why I suggest that uh, both the moniker 
moniker is a demonology and you know this new alien et hypothesis we've got to put both of them aside and say what if there's something deeper and darker lurking in the shadows that is using both fields of research as masks to itself where as long as we're thinking it's demonic or it's where it's alien we'll never truly understand the inner workings that are going on beyond the veil Mm -hmm. right what are they doing and and so this gets back into the esoteric nature of the phenomenon Uh, this gets back to, to travis taylor and how He's telling abductees, now it's your turn. It's time to go into churches and lay hands on people. What? Right? Yeah. What are we dealing with here? And this, you know, this is the age old lie that one researcher said, if we can manipulate our consciousness, we could gain access to them. Who wants access to them? No, I don't. (laughs) I don't want to deal with them. Right? Yeah. I don't want anything to do with that. No. Um, But there is something going on, and occasionally uh, we can see through the veil into the darkness, and they sometimes they give us insights. And like you know, one of those insights was, "Hey, we're not playing by your rules." You know, like I I tell everybody this in every show. I, I hate to say it again, but they must be playing a different game completely. And what if the rules that we were given by them, they were just propaganda to keep us in this this loophole of belief? Well, like a snake eating its own tail. Now, can I say something before we, yeah. and I don't want to ramble, but I want to Please say do. something. Sure. The, one of the major reasons that there is this theory being pushed that, okay, the cross works forever, it's because of Catholicism. Um, and, and I'm not striking out at them. I'm not doing that at all. So hope people don't take it that way. Right. But most of demonology within the field is only being represented through the lens of Catholicism. You do not have deep book researchers at Paragons. Yeah. Right? right. And so what's being proposed in the field is, okay, this is the way, this is the only way. And in order for that theory to be, to, to work, then we have to convince the population that it always works. Well, and, and to add to your point, to add to your point, it's, it's not just, and when I say I, I sat and watched a, a vial of holy water disappear, it's because it's the physical object that's disappearing. It's not, it, there is right. no, there's no belief behind it. If you don't have belief behind it, of course, it's going to dissipate. You have to have the the belief there that you have the power of God behind you in order to dissipate anything demonic. Otherwise, what do you have? If you don't have light to defeat dark, you have nothing. Right. Empty words or something. That's you're, right. You're 100% that's, right. That's right. That's right. So, that, but yeah. You, no, go ahead. Go ahead, yeah. my friend. No, it's, you know, it's disturbing to a degree. And, and you know, there, there's also this new this new movement in the field that wants to romanticize these views. I've even heard researchers on Facebook, you know, come out there and big name researchers. And, you know, I love and respect them highly. I have their books, but you know, when people come forward and say, you know what, I was assaulted and I've literally screenshotted on my phone, the researcher comes back and says, no, you weren't. Or, or, or that was just your perception of what happened. So we have to, we have to ignore the Hannibal Lecter versions, <laughs> right? Where, where, you know, good morning, Clarice. No, that didn't really happen to you. So there's a measure of the phenomenon that wants to gaslight true experiencers yeah. from coming forward with their stories of, yes, they helped me now. Um, and I, I, what breaks my heart, Tim, is, is I've actually had conversations with hosts just like yourself where, um, where, at, at, at conferences, at, at conferences and lectures and Paracon stuff, well, they're they're forced to, to buy into that and to propagate that theory. But in closed doors, they'll tell me, "Hey, there's something not right with this, right?" Because they were taking me as a kid. Yeah, they were showing up as Mickey Mouse, right? Mm-hmm. And so there has to be a fine line before we we stop trying to indoctrinate researchers and experiencers and telling them, hey, you know, there's only one good abduction, right? Mm-hmm. They're all, you know, it's just, they're all good, and it's like, no, maybe we have a little bit more darkness to deal with than we'd like to admit. Well, you know what that is 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 it's good old fashioned at times, Nathaniel. If I may interject here, there's times where it's good old fashioned American suck it up and take it and, and you're okay syndrome right you know right. um it's not as bad as you think it's okay just put one foot in front of the other and it'll all go away um 
you know, and, and I think a lot of what it is too is is people want to focus on their own thing, and 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 right. if you try to put too much on people, on other people, and say, well, I really need help here, a lot of people can't handle that. They can't handle other people's business, or they right. can't jump in and help other people. It takes a special person to take on another person's burdens. Right. And so right. when someone comes to you and says, man, I've got this overwhelming problem. I don't know if it's demonic, if it's alien, whatnot. It takes a special person to come through and say, you know what? I got you. I got your back. I'm going to help you. Right. Most people will say what you just said there. Nah, you know what? That, that isn't what you, what you think it was. Eh, buck up, oh. soldier. You know? Yeah, the arrogance, the unbridled arrogance to tell a woman, listen, that was all in your head. Yeah. I mean, stuck, seriously, I mean, I, I'm just being honest. I mean, I it, that's what turned my stomach and it made me realize, like, you know, some of my heroes shouldn't be my heroes in the field because if you're willing to look at a woman who has her own testimony, who had physical markings, documented physical markings on her body, ligature marks, mm -hmm. if you will. Yep. Well, that was in your head. That never really happened. Um, not only is that being disingenuous with the data, but it's shutting down voices of people just because their testimony is inconvenient. Yeah, yeah. It's and I hate it. <laughs> yeah, and that's the thing. If you if you have the data, if you have the evidence, if you have everything in front of you, and it's still in front of you, sometimes, like you said, there's a bit of. I don't want. To, I don't know if I should use this word because it's a little too bold. But there's a bit of cowardice there because you know then that yeah. you're you're ha you're going to have to step into it. It's up to you then to step up because mm -hmm. someone's coming to you for help, Correct. and you have to make the move then. So it's either you have to take it on or you have to find somebody to take it on. One or the other. Right. And in many cases, these individuals just want an, an ear to bend, you know, hey, I just want to know, like, okay, so, so what started happening in my, my career was once I started coming out with these case studies, more people started coming out of the woodwork and saying, hey, dude, you know, stuff that they could have never known, because I didn't even talk about it. Mm -hmm. They're confirming, right? Not only did I have a, a bite mark on me, but I had ligature marks where something or someone was physically holding me down during this assault. Um, so, you know, and again, and I'm going to say this, and this might be controversial. I mean, I'm already being controversial, so might as well wait in the deep. There you go. But um, here's the problem, you know, uh, if it doesn't fit my blueprint, it, it's, it doesn't exist. Right. And, and in doing that, uh, many ufologists become just as dogmatic, just as dogmatic as many Christian researchers are. Right. Where right. It, it can't be that because that's not what I believe in. It doesn't matter at this point. We've got to we've got to grow out of the dogma and grow into the data if we're ever going to fully understand what we're experiencing. So why do you think that these researchers stay in their lane, so to speak? Why is it that they're they're sticking to what they think they know and not willing to expand outward? Well, let's get back to Dr. Carla Turner, which she, she was doing a lecture and giving a lecture rather, and she talks about how little we can trust channel material. I mean, if you look at even Dr. Barry Fitzgerald said, you know, the reason we believe these are aliens is because they've told us they're aliens. <laughs> mm. But they've also told us they're deceased. They've told us they're angels. They've told us they're demons. They've told us they're dear Aunt Edna, mm -hmm. right? They, mm -hmm. they told that young man that it was his ex-girlfriend. I had a case where a lady had uh, reached out to me through another host of a show she was in bed one night and her husband approached her on the side of the bed, looked just like her husband, you know, Yep. they had, they were intimate. And then all of a sudden when she's looking at him, he's in a daze and all of a sudden he just starts grinning from ear to ear and tilts his head at her. And that's when she told me, she said, Nathaniel, it, it, it wasn't my husband. And when she realized that, she looked over and her husband had been laying next to her asleep. The entity had put him asleep. And then when she looks back at the entity, it didn't, it didn't change his shape. It turns into this wispy, uh, basically this wispy, smoky apparition. And then it floats out through the hallway and out the door. So, <laughs> but that never happened because it doesn't put my blueprint of the phenomenon, right? You understand what I'm saying? It, yeah. it, it doesn't yeah. make any sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. Bizarre. Bizarre. 
All right, so I'm going to ask you here, do uh, the, the, the question I said I'd come to at the, the end of the program, unless you have some other points you want to bring up here. Uh, um, yeah, I just think we can't trust channel material. You asked me a question. It's a very good question. Why do they believe otherwise? It's because a lot of their material is coming from channeled guides. Okay. Okay. And their guides are telling these victims, well, that's, you know, that's not really, again, it's the same point that one researcher made. It's not really what you thought it was. Okay. Well, it sure felt like it. Right. And so what they're doing though, is they're gaslighting people into believing their, their, their made up version. Right. Right. And the question is how much can we trust these guides? That's the truth of the matter. But, um, Go ahead, go ahead. You gotta say something else. I don't want to. Oh no, no, no! I, I was, uh, I was saying we're we're coming to right around the end of the program here. So I was, I was, uh, right. I was saying there's this one question that I wanted to throw out there because you know, when, yeah. as we're talking about this, as we're talking about how vulnerable, I guess that's the word I want right. to use. Vulnerable, we seem mm-hmm. to be as a species uh, to these entities. We'll put it that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, how it seems like we can we can project our permission for them to to take us over or t- take our seed or take our wombs or 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 be used as breeding factories or be used as husks how how do we stop them how do we stop them from taking our implied permission yes um I'm, okay so i'm still out on the efficiency of religious ambulance. Um, some cases they work, some cases they don't. We don't know why. And even if we do know they work, we don't know why they work. This is the problem with uh, especially a lot of exorcisms where we know it was successful, but why? Mm-hmm. Right? And so a lot of us, especially in demonology, they, they base the validity of their right on the rate of success, not necessarily on the reason for it. Okay. Right. right. So uh, I'm my jury, my jury. At least my I don't have a jury, but if I did, I'm still out on um, the efficiency of religious amulets. But I, I do recommend carrying them more than anything else. Iron. 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 Right. Um, there is a uh, one inscription I read in Mesopotamia. Again, this is not a modern phenomenon. It's a modern interpretation of an age, age old phenomenon. But in Mesopotamia, uh, these beings were taking babies out of the wombs as well. Now, I'm not even talking about the mother gives birth, right? It's a changeling, right, aspect for case study where it just takes the baby. No, it, it was still in the womb. There's no baby there the next morning. And so what, what was happening to these women, it's a classic UFO abduction phenomenon. Something would be sent down upon them while they're sleeping, stare into their eyes, Whoa. And uh, right, and then steal that baby, and so they were considered to be baby snatchers, which is that's literally uh, when you get into the Acadian and the English translation, that's what they were called. Now, what's the difference between a baby snapper and the missing fetus syndrome, or the baby snatcher and the missing fetus? Nothing. Yeah, yeah. But uh, what these mothers learned to do was they took iron and they had created necklaces, and these necklaces had the uh, shape and style of faces and so they would try to to make a a a, 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 an iron image of their face so that this is crazy but it shows you how vulnerable we are so that in the hopes that when that entity manifests again tomorrow night that it will stare into the wrong eyes oh that way the next morning the baby will still be there so they even then right we have case studies of, of humans encountering whatever these things are, and they're, they're, they're awesome. They're just like us. They're groping in the darkness, trying to wiggle their their way into some form of warfare where these beings, for whatever reason, will be hindered from taking babies from the womb. Um, but that would be my recommendation. You know, iron, even if it's nails, if it's uh, a necklace, Anything iron, and I know that I'm not the only one that recommends that. Dr. Barry Fitzgerald, I think Steve Mayer recommends that as well. Really? Iron. Interesting. Interesting. So just as a matter of protection in general, if you, if you believe maybe your 
somewhat vulnerable to something like that? Maybe you've had a run-in with something negative in the past. Just right. get some sort of iron. That would be my recommendation. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Very interesting. Man, I'm telling you. You're always bringing it heavy, Nathaniel. Always bringing it heavy on this show. I, I man, I, oh, man, man, you're always always blowing my mind, buddy. That's for sure. That's for sure. Dude, uh, it's my privilege, man. It's my honor to be with you. And like I said, you're one of my favorite hosts ever. Yeah, right. I just I like you, dude. Even if you weren't a host, I would be like, you know, I want to buy that guy a beer sometime and just hang out. <laughs> uh, the feeling's mutual. The feeling's mutual. Before we go, before we go today, yeah. um, you did say you'd been on the convention circuit. You've been doing some stuff. Do you yeah. have a favorite story from the convention circuit that you want to tell people before we go? Today? Uh, just to hang out with, just to hang out with people, man. I went to the the convention in Quincy. I think it was last year or the year before. And it was just really neat. And I met Mike Ricksecker, a bunch of other, some of my other favorite researchers as well. And, mm-hmm along with him. And it was just really cool. I met Tim Weisberg just hanging out. Yeah. You know, you know what I mean? It was just, um, it was great to meet like, meet like-minded people. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Cause I've been, I was stuck in the church circuit for like 10 years mm-hmm. and there's, you know, if it ain't, if it ain't devils and demons, bro, they're like, what? I'm like, well, you know what I mean? So it's kind of, it was really refreshing to yeah. just sit down and have an honest conversation about this stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I love Mike. Love Tim. They're, they're both uh, great guys. Yeah. Yeah. I did a, yeah. I did a presentation last year with Tim at uh, Michigan Paracon. It was fun. A lot of awesome. Fun. Dude. So it was, it was, uh, it was mainly about uh, funny experiences we both had in radio over uh, 30 years. <laughs> so it, there's a lot of uh, listener, uh, listener calls and emails and stuff like that. And kind oh. of, some if funny. I could have been a fly on the wall, I would, I would have loved that conversation. <laughs> I think it's taped somewhere. I might have to, if somebody taped it, I'll send you the Yeah. Tape. But yeah, it was, it was a funny presentation between the two of us. Any new books or anything coming, coming our way? Um, no, no, I know I'm, I'm looking at working with a publisher, an, an, an actual publisher. Nothing new on the horizon, but, uh, you know, I'll, I'll update you if there is right now. I'm, trying to to solidify an actual hypothesis that i'm really backing okay right because the data is it's everywhere i mean there are some things that are non-negotiables like you know we're, we're being deceived in many cases mm-hmm. um but you know my, my research right now is centered around okay what are these protocols of relief and why is it like if they could just take seed at any time they wanted to then why would they have to play the role of someone yeah Right. There, yeah. There's some kind of tacit agreement occurring when we are around the phenomenon that we have to get our, I don't know, to pay attention to. So that's where I'm at right now. OK. All right. Well, Nathaniel Gillis, thank you so much for being on the program today. And uh, let's talk again very, very soon. Let's uh, let's uh, catch up and uh, we'll have you on the show again. And uh, we'll, again, when uh, we want to talk about uh, some other things that are both demon and alien related. <laughs> wonderful man and thank you so much tim i love you like a brother and uh and thank you so much for for darkness for listening and i hope you guys enjoy it yep thank you appreciate you want to thank nathaniel gillis for being on the program today man i want to talk about eye-opening every single time he comes on the program always brings the heat always brings the information i want to thank him so much for being on really becoming a good brother every time he comes on the program Always bring something informative. And again, check out your local convention to see if Nathaniel is is coming your way because he's always got something good to bring to your town, to your paranormal convention. I want to thank you guys for tuning in for another great week of Darkness Radio. We've got lots of good stuff coming down the pike here in the month of June. I want you to keep tuned to this podcast. If you're not subscribed, by all means, please subscribe. And if you've got some good words and good reviews for us, put up a five-star review uh, at Apple Podcasts, at Spotify, wherever you listen to us. We appreciate that review. And if you don't have a good review for us, well, yeah, we've seen those two. <laughs> I, I, I digress. Again, folks, have a good weekend. Take care of yourself and each other. If you have somebody out there who maybe needs your help or attention, be sure to give a helping hand. Be sure to help somebody out, maybe with their lawn. We're in summertime now. There's lots of elderly people out there that may need your help with uh, taking care of a lawn or taking care of outside things that need to be taken care of, some repairs around the house, outside, or even inside. 
I know there are lots of organizations out there that are in need of volunteers. Maybe you could do some volunteer work over the weekend. Uh, just please leave it a little bit better than what you found it. A little uh, tip from your buddies here at Darkness Radio. I'll be up at KNSI this weekend, knsiradio.com, on Saturday morning between 7 and 9 a.m. Central Time. And again, a reminder that Beer City Bruiser is training the professional wrestlers of the future. You can check him out at AML Wrestling in North Carolina if you'd like to be trained to become a professional wrestler. I want to thank Mally Fox and Jessica Freeberg as well, both members of Darkness Radio. Although you don't hear them as often as you hear the two of us, uh, they are right there. and want to thank them for their participation in Darkness Radio as well. Again, have a great weekend, folks. We'll see you next week for the best in paranormal programming. This is Darkness Radio.